Mayor. Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association, which has 23 countries that are members. As part of our efforts to promote play, we're happy to introduce our Porch Play Chats. And these are conversations that focus on a wide range of topics with experts that are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the latest Porch Play Chats on the ipausa.org website. And you can click in that top right-hand corner for our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our Instagram, which isn't great yet, but will get better. I'm Deb Lawrence, president of IPA USA, and with me on the porch is Lisa Murphy, one of our board members. Lisa, hello. Hello, hello. hello. And for those of you who have been in the early childhood field forever, and those of you who have not been in it very long, you are getting ready to have a treat with Peter Pizzolongo. I've known Peter. I don't know, Peter. We won't talk about how long I've known you. <laughs> but <laughs> Peter, <clears throat> sorry, is the president of early education consulting and a former vice president of the Delaware AUIC governing board. He's held positions of training and technical assistance at the National Center on Early Childhood Education, Teaching and Learning at zero to three. And he was the associate executive director for professional development at NAEYC and the director of analytical support and technical assistance services division at CSR Incorporated, a social science research and management support firm. So Peter has over 30 years of experience as an author, uh, doing training and technical assistance, program evaluation, and Head Start and Child Care Agency administrators and a teacher, which is really important. And Peter is a prolific author with other, over 30 publications. So he, we get to share today with Peter, and he's going to talk to us about encouraging risky play, which is something that if you've listened to any porch play chats, you know we are not doing enough of. So Peter, why is it important for us to support children's play that involves taking risks? What do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, if we want to look at what the children are doing, let's start with where we are. So let's look at adults taking risks just, just briefly. And, and it, it's not uncommon. I mean, we often set out to learn something new. Um, sometimes it's in the, the uh, cognitive domain. You, you're going to take a language course as, as an adult. Um, I think I've taken, I've started taking Spanish probably 80 times. So eventually it'll stick. Um, and so you might be taking a course online or going to a community college. Um, you, you might enter a group of potential friends. I mean, that's taking a risk, particularly as an adult. I mean, it, it's a lot easier to make friends when you're a little kid. As an adult, it's pretty risky to enter a group that's already formed um, and taking that kind of a risk. And then I think for a lot of adults, we enjoy taking a, a physical risk. Um, you know, in, in my semi-retirement years, I've taken up yoga and Tai Chi. So, um, you know, I had dabbled in yoga before, but now it's like, you know, three times a week I'm doing yoga and three times a week I'm doing Tai Chi. So that's the kind of thing. Remember George W. Bush, the late George W. Bush, um, no, George H. Bush, um, he did skydiving for his 80, 85th birthday. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not 85 yet. I don't know that I'll try that though, because I'm already a little uh, <clears throat> shaky. Um, so why why do adults take risks? Um, well, there's sensation seeking. Uh, you know, it's something it's it's fun to do. Impulsivity. You know, the now is a time when you can do something on an impulse, and then it opens up all these new opportunities. It's a way that we show our confidence. It's a way that we, we can stand out from the others if that's something that you wanted to do. And most importantly, we learn from risks. Um, you learn how, you know, you're just upping the ante on yourself. And so you're going to learn, you know, learn new things. So for young children, I think a lot, most of that, probably all of that applies as well. Um, and um, you know, I don't have to say too much about the importance of play um, in the in the new developmentally appropriate practice uh, uh, position statement. Um, I'm going to read that: that play promotes joyful learning that fosters self-regulation, language, cognitive, and social competencies, as well as content knowledge across disciplines. And I I like that definition. The previous version of DAP, the 2009 version, as much as I loved it and did a lot of training on it 
uh, for, in that version, play was mostly about mature sociodramatic play. Um, so I think in this version, we've expanded that more to the kind of play that, that we, we all think is, is important for young children. So when children are playing, they're developing symbolic uh, and, and, and imaginative thinking, peer relationships, language, et cetera. So then we look at children learning to take safe risks. Um, now, a safe risk, um, and this, I'm using a definition from my friend, Rusty Keeler. Um, if you've seen, seen this book, uh, Rusty, what a, it's such a, see, I got all my little post-its in it. It's such a, it's such a <laughs> wonderful book. Um, and he says, um, safe risks are situations that a child can perceive and choose whether or not they want to participate. Now, risks that aren't safe are called hazards. So, you, you know, you have to think about that. It's something that's truly dangerous for a child, a situation where the kid can't see something that's an obstacle that's there. And you as an adult, you know that. The kid can't make a logical choice about what to do. And there's a definite chance of hurting him. You know, jumping off of the second step of the, of the ladder to the slide, that, that's a, that could be a safe risk for most children. Jumping off from the top, not safe for anybody, any child or any adult. So, um, so that's important for them to understand that difference. And as we know with young children, they learn mostly from their experiences. So some experiences you want them to not have, um, but having many experiences where they're successful at risky play is, is what's important. Um, so it's, we'd help kids to learn to assess risk and decide if it's a risk that they want to take. And that is something that we take with us for our entire life. You know, I know now how to assess risks um, and decide if it's something that I want to do or not. But when, Peter, one thing that I see a lot is that teachers don't let children take risks. Any risks. Because any, because they're afraid they're gonna, the teacher is gonna get in trouble or the parents will be mad. Yeah. yeah. And so I have to push back against that and say, if you don't let them figure out where their body is in space and what they can and cannot do, they're going to take much more dangerous risks later. Yeah. And so, you know, when they're only wanting to jump off or go up the slide instead of down it, that you should let them try that, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. it should be something that's okay because we're so risk averse. Yeah. That yeah. It's, it's and, scary me a bit. And I think, you know, there's a number of things that, are, that have happened in society. I think for one thing, we don't have neighborhoods with a bunch of children in them so much anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so kids are pretty much staying in front of their house um, and or staying in their house <laughs> because there's nobody out there to play with. So, you know, and, and for most of us, as we were growing up, you know, the rule was you leave the house, you don't go any place that's not safe. And when the street lights come on, you come back home. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be nice if you came home for lunch as well. But, you know, mm -hmm. so we were just we were just out there. Now, you know what that's called? Because I've heard this in, in my community. That's called free range parenting. We mm -hmm. used to call that parenting. But, you know, now, now we have free range children. And of course, the converse, I hate the phrase, but I'll have to say it now. Um, that I that I went there. It's the helicopter parenting. You know, it's like I know where you are. I know what you're doing. You know, and we have we have our little devices all the time to stay to stay in touch. So it's important for teachers and teachers in working with parents as well to assess their own risk management. What are they comfortable? What kind of risks are they comfortable with? And um, you know, it might be important might be necessary in an early childhood program um, to focus on taking risks and have adults do things that take them out of their comfort zone um, because that's what we want to do for young children. Now, the other thing that, um, that this brings to mind for me is understanding truly what children are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the three uh, core uh, core considerations of development and appropriate practice is a commonality. What are, what are the ages and stages that most children will go through at particular ages? Individuality, what is this particular child's strengths, interests, areas of need? And then what is the social and cultural context in which this child lives? So you've got all this stuff going on for, you know, if you're a preschool teacher and you have 16, 18 children, you know this for all of those children. 
hopefully you've written it down so that <laughs> you can bring this up as a reminder. Um, and so when you, so whoops, looking back at the first one, oops, sorry, my wonderful lighting system here, looking back at the first one, um, using some valid information about what children are capable of doing at, at various ages. So I often go to the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework. I mean, it was developed by the Office of Head Start, but it is applicable to children in all kinds of settings, Head Start, child care, part day preschool, family child care, as well as center-based, et cetera. Um, and it is available, um, I'll say for free, but really you've already paid for it with your tax dollars. Um, and it's available on the Head Start website, the ECLKC, um, <clears throat> Early Childhood Learning and Teaching and Knowledge Center. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so understanding this is what a child is capable of doing. Um, and then, you know, you're going you're gonna to help if the child is, if, if your three-year-old is not where that book says this three-year-old should be, then perhaps you can help that to up the ante for the child. You know, if this is a child who's never climbed the ladder of the uh, <clears throat> uh, for the slide, to to give that child some experiences in just doing some climbing before they do that whole scary thing of getting getting all the way to the top. So um, so, but it, going back to um, teachers not allowing children, um, you know, it's. It, it's part of your job to, to encourage children and support children to take safe risks. Because if um, you don't- I'm gonna interrupt, my turn. Yeah. Okay, okay. And, and I like the word facilitate, like we're, we're facilitating the risk-taking experience or opportunity, right? I mean, it's, right, right. and I, I always like to point out that, that nobody is announcing to the children, like you're allowed to jump off the slide yeah, here. Yeah, you know, nobody, yeah. Nobody's announcing that, but when it happens, we temper, our overreaction to it. Because that, as we all know, the minute you scream at the child who's yeah. jumping, that's yeah. when they trip and fall and get startled and break their wrist yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. So, and it might seem like a subtle thing to point out, but I think it's important because I think sometimes the people who are like, and, and I'm probably speaking for us here and probably many of our viewers are, are advocates of risky play and rough and tumble play. And and, and naysayers and, and people who are, are maybe more pushback and, they're, I think they're worried sometimes that we're like announcing, you know, that you're allowed to do it here and more and more instigating a risky play experience than facilitating a risky play experience mm -hmm. too. Yeah, and I think a, lo a lot of it comes from the child does something and then, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a child initiated activity. Um, and so your response is very important. So uh, thanks for that, Lisa, because that's, you know, think of the training that, that uh, medical professionals, healthcare professionals must have. It's like, you know, they just, you just, they, they walked into your, your room and they're holding the MRI results and they can't look at it and go, oh my God, you know? Right. <laughs> it's, hello, I'd like to talk to you about your results. All right. Yeah. Um, so I think for a teacher, it's, wow, you jumped really far. Um, now, if, you know, if what the kid did is you'd label more of a, as a hazard, you know, so then it's, you know, you jumped really far and I'm, I'm a little concerned. I don't know how safe that was. Let's try this from the second rung on the ladder first. And then, um, <clears throat> so, so, so providing that specific kind of feedback, this is what you did. And we all, you know, we all hate, well, hate's a strong word. We're not real big fans of good job, because no. that tells them absolutely nothing. Um, but if you're very specifically saying, this is something that you've done, I see what you've done, I'm aware of what you've done, um, then this is what's gonna help that kid develop confidence and, and, and to continue to assess risks and say, this is what, this is what I can do with my body. Um, and this is what uh, what is important for me to do right now. Uh, and do you this think, Peter, I'm going to yeah. push back a little bit. Okay. Do, do you do you think if if a child has shown me, and maybe it's a one time thing, like I'd never seen it before, to this jumping off the slide example. Mm -hmm. Let's say he jumps off and he's fine. He lands safely. He didn't get hurt. Like, is that really a hazard versus? follow my train of thought, mm -hmm. if whether I know this child is capable or not of, of landing safely from that height, there's mm -hmm. a sheet of ice 
or a sharp rock or a mislaid piece of wood with a nail sticking out of it. Like then I think I would be more inclined to be like, well, hold on, you know, I'm noticing that there is some ice under here. Yeah. I'm yeah. worried now if you jump off this, you're going to slip, come back down a little lower and let's work our way up. But I, I guess I'm almost directly asking Peter, if you think that there's room for the fact that what might be a risk versus a hazard for one kid, that there's room that his risk is that his risk threshold might be a little broader. So right. then right. when that one kid comes that I don't know at all, mm -hmm. then we kind of scaffold that risk, right? Like, you know, let me mm -hmm. let Miss Lisa see you jump off the first step and now right. the second right. step, you know, and and maybe kind of baby stepping towards it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a couple of things at play here. Part of it is in, within the definition of what is a hazard that you see an obstacle that the child might not see right away. Like it's, right. there's, there's ice down here, there's a nail sticking out of this board. Why is this board here anyway? Um, right, right. So, so, so there is that. And then there's also um, looking at the core considerations. I know what most children should be able to do at this age. And I, um, you, I don't know. I mean, so I'm still working on core consideration number two. So let's try these other things first. first. You know, we, we are still in charge, um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that uh, when people think about an emergent curriculum, if you know, the teacher is not just sitting back and waiting for things to emerge, you're, you're scaffolding, you're, you're providing feedback, you're, you're at times giving instruction. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the world of the sliding boards has changed a lot since I was on the sliding board because they used to be in a very shiny metal and oh, um, hot yourself, <laughs> you know, sliding down and wearing shorts to be at the top. Yeah. So I think they've improved, but still there are some hazards connected connected to them. I was in a, a actually it's the, it's the big playground here in, in Rehoboth where I, where I live, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Um, and they still have, what are those things called that spin around and around? Merry go around. Merry go off of them. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Great. I mean, I was watching this, you know, and I'm, nobody, nobody died, nobody got hurt, <laughs> and I, and and you know, did they know how to use it, Peter? Hmm? Did they know? Did they know what it was they for? They did. They did. Now they were a little older. They they were okay. not three and four years old, um, and there was no one, you know, because sometimes. Uh, some kids can get a little carried away and it's like, I think you're scared, so I'm gonna spin it even faster. So, you know, there was, no, there was none of that. And that's the kind of thing that as, a, as the adult, as the teacher, that you need to pay attention to as well, certainly. Um, but it's um, it written, it's important for the teachers, you know, back to the original question, it's important for the teachers to uh, know what their own risk tolerance is, you know, and as I said, if my risk tolerance is uh, really low, and <laughs> there's not much I'm going to let you do, then it's time for some professional development, which include coaching and, and, and mentoring uh, to help that teacher understand these are important things for kids to do. Um, I'll, I'll tell a little story on myself when I was a Head Start Education Coordinator and I was buying all kinds of fun things for the classrooms. Um, some company had come up with stilts for preschoolers. So it was a flat board and then there was a little hole in it here where your foot goes and then handles. The teachers did not want to use it. So I thought I'll show them. So I go to a classroom and I said, show them this is how it's done. So I stuck my big old feet in those little holes and couldn't get him out. Oh, no. straight back. Oh, <laughs> oh. so um, and the teachers are so like, see. <laughs> and do I need to call an ambulance? <laughs> so, Maybe. Yeah. So you know, so um, you know, my risk tolerance was wrong in, in in that situation. So sometimes you have to consider that as well. And in that situation, the teachers are right that this thing was a hazard, and I've not seen them since. So <laughs> apparently, enough uh, administrators probably fell down demonstrating how to use demonstrating how to use it. Yeah, yeah, I think with the professional development and the coaching piece too, a, a critical factor of that is allowing the the teacher. Um, to reminisce a little bit about their own play history and their own play experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't think it would be out of line to say that if you grew up in a more risk tolerant household or a risk tolerant um, educational environment, chances are you're probably more inclined a little bit to be more accommodating to that.
So yeah, what, what, we, yeah. what we experienced our own self, we all know definitely plays into how we facilitate environments. Yeah. Well, and if, and if you had a helicopter parent that was like, oh, honey, be careful. Oh, be safe. Oh, don't get dirty. Oh, well, you know, which, you know, they, they're parenting the way they were parented probably, or the exact opposite. And, and so, you know, we have to take that into consideration too. So when you have a playground of children and you have two or three teachers out there, children may be getting mixed messages from oh, yeah. every teacher is like, you can't do that. But I, Ms. Lisa, but Lisa said, said I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're her problem. No, you can't say yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to turn you into Ms. the Lisa director. isn't here today. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've heard that. All that horrible stuff oh. we say. <laughs> Miss Lisa is in here today. I've heard that from, from <laughs> teachers. Here's what we're going to do. Yes, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think, I think we've, 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 hit, we've hit all the key points that, you know, as an adult, you need to figure out what is my own risk tolerance? Um, mm -hmm. What are my capabilities of assessing risks and how can I help children to assess risks so that they're taking safe risks? And we think, we think of this in the, mostly in the physical domain, but there are certainly cognitive mm -hmm. and language risks um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and social and emotional risks as well. You know, and, and, uh, That's so, a good point, Peter. And I, I'm, I'm writing that down minute. actually. I, I think we do um, focus more on the physical. You know, we mm -hmm. forget that, that learning how to read is a risk. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. approaching somebody new and saying hello and good morning, uh, perhaps speaking Spanish for the first time is yeah. all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. Good point. I know. When, when, I've, when I've been in a, in a multilingual classroom or, or if it's monolingual and it's not English, um, you know, I'll attempt some words and, I, you know, that's, I'm thinking I'm being so brave. Um, the kids are just very understanding and they love to correct you know gringo's uh, attempts at spanish so mm -hmm. so you well, know think, adults are taking a risk and, and for children playing with each other and speaking different languages that's that's a risk that they're taking as well so you know i wanted to go back because i think this is i think you and lisa raised a good point with you know risk is more than just physical risk because i also think what do we do to children when we shut down that risk taking by, you know, I'm going to show you the flashcards of all the letters and you're supposed to guess. Right. And <sighs> if I guess wrong, you say, no, that's not, that's wrong. And, mm -hmm. and so then we shut them down. Right. So it, we shut them down because they're, they feel like they failed mm -hmm. when we're asking them to do something that they're not yet ready to do, or they may have no prior knowledge, and who cares that only letters they care about are letters in their name. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I think I think just like we shut down risk on the playground, we shut down risk academically, we shut down risk socially. I I, I just always go back to um, this child that I had when I was a director. And fortunately, uh, we had tried every, I had every, his name was Philip. <laughs> He's probably an adult with many children now. Um, and Philip was very rough in a classroom. You know, if he wanted a toy, he'd take it away from you and throw it on the ground and walk away. Or he'd go knock down all your blocks or he, you know, and so we were constantly, Philip, you know, how do you think that made blah, blah, blah feel and blah, 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 blah. But it was when Karen Miller came to my center to write her third toddler book. And she always came to my center when she was writing her books and to play in my toddler room. And when she came, I said to her during a break, I said, okay, I need to, I need you to look at a child. We've had Philip since he was 18 months old. These are all the things we've tried. Mm -hmm. through the list you know and philip still does these things so obviously we're not doing something that philip needs and so i i need help and so sure enough karen miller i'm not kidding was in that room for eight minutes we had had philip since he was 18 months old and he's in a three and a half year old room <laughs> she walks into my office and she said he doesn't know how to invite himself into play mm -hmm. and i went oh my god yeah <laughs> Yeah. Two years of Philip. 
yeah. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yeah. Which which should be the lesson to everyone: ask for help. It's okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> ask for help. Right. I know that when when I've been uh, fortunate enough to be an observer in a, in a, in a classroom. Um, you know, the non-participant observer is interesting because the kids don't know that you're a non-participant observer. So exactly, yeah. I have, I have, I have a picture hanging up here of uh, uh, the kids decorated me while I was sitting there taking notes about what, what was happening, and they put a, a purse on my arm. They gave me a hat, which you know, mm -hmm. a child-sized plastic hat that they kept pushing down. Uh, so, but but as an observer. I mean, not only, so I, I was very good at, and I still am if I'm asked to do it, um, at this is what the teacher said and did. This is the child's response. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, and this, you know, when I was teaching, I'm so focused on what I'm doing that, mm -hmm. you know, and if it's the same thing that I've done a hundred times and it's always worked, that I might not notice that it didn't work with this kid. So, um, you know, so I think one of the one of the lessons for teachers is, if you have something that you're very good at and it's always been successful, then keep doing it. But when you get to that kid for whom it doesn't work, then you do something different. It doesn't mean you throw out what, you, what you've already done with the other kids. So, yeah. yeah, stretch a little bit. And, and, and you know, and there were kids, I, 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 you know, when I, when I was teaching my group, you know, I know this is what these kids capabilities of and this is what these kids uh, challenges are. And so, um, you know, so then I'm going to respond accordingly. Yeah. And you know, that's true in so many situations. And certainly when we're talking about kids who are taking risks, um, <clears throat> knowing this is what you're doing. When one of the uh, child care centers that I, I was the director slash preschool teacher. And in the summer, we took them to the local community pool. And, um, you know, some of them, I mean, some of them, they thought sunbathing was the object. And, but for, you know, a lot of the kids, and I wasn't teaching swimming to three and four year olds, I was teaching, you know, how to be in the water safely. And um, turned my back at one point, kid taps me on the shoulder, and he said, Stephanie went in. And, I, <laughs> you know, it only takes a split second. Stephanie was not a swimmer. She was only three years old, but she still had, it's a reflex. Yeah. She still had that reflex where she went over on her back and she was, <laughs> so I, you know, I jumped in and then I just sort of carried her on because I didn't want to, you know, scare her. Or scare her, her. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, you just, okay, now let's remember you do not go in the water without Mr. Peter. So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it's, you know, it's like I learned something about Stephanie now and so that's someone who I'm really going to keep an eye on because she's going to uh, she's more in the hazard end of, of risk taking than the safe risk end so well well I think that that's also true with the kids who are too safe too right mm -hmm. so again we go back to those three pillars right it's individual there are some general guidelines about development it's individual and it's all within their context so if if I feel, if I'm the teacher in a classroom and I notice a child who is fearful of taking risks and it's not a sensory thing. So let's just say I threw finger paint on the, on the table as a, one of the choices for art if they chose to do it. And she might be a sit and watcher. Fine, absolutely, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, watch as long as you want. And, and so then I might go over to her if she's been a sit and watcher for a while I might say, would you like to touch the paint? And she, you know, I don't want to touch the paint. Um, are you, what, what if I gave you a glove? Would you like to touch the paint then, you know? And then, and so I sort of worked problems on my way through trying to get to, and, and sometimes the answer was, I can't get dirty. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or um, I, I don't like the way it feels. I'd say, okay, well, that's what you like to do. And we'd move on. Right. But I, you know, I think it's <laughs> having a teacher that is a facilitator that can that can ask those questions and try to not force them to mm -hmm. do something they're not wanting to do. Well, do they need permission? Like they might need permission to enter that, um, regardless of what that is, right? So I, I think there's degrees. Like some kids are just the the watchers, and that's cool. They are getting. That's it. 100 percent what they need other kids are like can somebody like i don't know how to verbalize this yet but 
I need somebody to help me get here. Mm -hmm. um, and some kids need somebody to help them get there in a way that makes accommodations for them. Like I had a kid who would paint with their elbows, but would never touch it with their hands, but would paint <laughs> like this all day long but if it touched their hand it's be like ah like panic panic you yeah. know and so we we and then as teachers we started learning specific to this kind of risk that it, that that we needed to be cautious that we weren't lumping kids into like oh that's a kid that doesn't touch stuff because maybe they'll touch it with their elbow or their foot like huh yeah. never stop yeah. to think of give them a brush give them a wooden spoon so it, you know in, instead of just resting on the laurels of thinking that we had figured it out how can we learn from this for the next group of kids in here as well? How, because I want to facilitate the risk to the degree that the child is needing. It's comfortable. It. Yeah, right. right. And it's comfortable. And I think that takes some finesse on the facilitator's part. But it you takes first us have not to... having a goal of not having yeah. an adult agenda in our head, I think. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Well, and the other piece that that touches on uh, as children are learning how to take safe risk is they're learning how to manage fear. Um, mm -hmm. It's okay to be afraid of something. Um, mm -hmm. It's not okay to be so afraid that you're catatonic, but, um, but you know, this is something I'm afraid of. And I think a lot of, I don't think I know, a lot of uh, children's fears um, are reactions of the parents' oh. same fear. My mm -hmm. mommy was so afraid of dogs. Now she mm -hmm. was good about letting us have little dogs as pets when we were younger. But if we're walking down the street and there was someone with the German Shepherd or you know some other large dog, a Husky, uh, we cross the street. And so um, I, I, I think that there was a point in my young adult life when I would have a, a galvanic skin response to, <laughs> to seeing a large dog which would irritate the dog. So then it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I had to learn how to manage that fear. I now have two dogs. I'm surprised they haven't barked yet. Uh, one of them is behind me snoring. So I hope you know, <laughs> I hope the mic not picking that up. Um, but, you know, so I, I had to learn how to manage that fear. Um, I remember uh, when, when I lived in Washington, D.C., my parents came to visit. I took my mother to the uh, Shenandoah uh, National Park. We were on the Massanutten Mountains. And so I took, you know, parked the car and I took her to the edge. And she suddenly she froze and she backed up. And I said, do you have a fear of heights? And she said, I guess so. It never came up before. You know, <laughs> so here's wow. 80s I think <laughs> so she had to learn to manage that fear but you know I think she figured by then it doesn't matter but um we'll just avoid mountains so mm -hmm. uh, you know so I think with young children it's like yes this is something that you seem to be afraid of tell me about it and and mm -hmm. and so to to help the kid understand um it's okay to have a fear of this and and if it's something you really want to do then let's just work through this mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> Well, and I think, Peter, what you're, what, what the whole thing, the whole porch play chat has been around, you have to have a relationship with the child. Yeah. You can't just have a relationship with the class. Mm. In order for them to be able to trust you enough that maybe you can help them manage things that scare them, right? Yeah. So they have, you have to have this strong, positive trusting relationship with every child in the classroom and it's going to look different with every child in the classroom yeah. but the teacher has to establish that in order to help children manage risk or in order to understand that this child isn't capable of doing what I'm yet asking them to do and mm -hmm. I need to scaffold more so you know it's a whole it's a whole thing that Teachers and facilitators really need to recognize that it's not a monolithic lithic group of three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Every one of them is different. Yeah. And, and I think that's hard sometimes because we're so busy and there's so many expectations piled on top of teachers that I think sometimes we're doing the stuff that is the expectations and we're losing sight of what we really should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's knowing, all right, so I know the, uh, <clears throat> the expectations for what three-year-olds should be able to do, and I'm teaching a class of threes. Well, you also have to know the expectations for twos and fours. And fours. Because, 
that's where you're going to have some of the kids. So exactly. it's like in that brain. You were reading my mind, Peter. I was yeah. going to casually do the, remember, two years up and two years back. You yeah. Developmental yeah. mixed ages, people, whether it doesn't matter what age is on the door, you yeah. still have yeah. developmental mixed ages. So am I making room for the fact that that one three-year-old today might have that physical ability of a five-year-old? And mm -hmm. I need to be willing to make room for that and not just treat them like a two-year-old yeah mm -hmm. because yeah. that's maybe developmentally where the rest of the group is yeah, yeah. you know you, you set up your your balance beam and it's sitting on one hollow block you know on, on each end and that's working so well for most of the kids but you've got that that one kid who he's been doing this since he was two and he's messed so you need two hollow blocks for that kid mm -hmm. you know and then it, explaining to the other children that you know this is something he's capable of doing Perhaps you're not capable of doing it yet. I think the word yet and, and the phrase not now, I, I, th mm -hmm. I think that, that I think that is helpful. Um, <clears throat> and it's something if you want to learn to do that, it's something we could work on. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, don't don't limit the kid who can do the higher balance beam just because everybody else has to do the lower one is, is more comfortable than the lower one. Yeah. So Peter is always this has been amazing. And you have to come back and do at least, you know, five more. So <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Not a problem. I, I'm soon um, we'll not travel. Yes. Actually, I Peter, I'm going to plant a bug in your ear because we riffed a little bit there about the observation piece. I would like for you to consider perhaps talking a little bit about um, how, how does play and observing maybe dance together, but you can oh, think yeah. about that. Yeah. You can yeah. think about that. We'll send you the dates for January and see if any of them work. Okay. But um to learn more about IPA USA, be sure to visit our website at ipausa.org. And until next time, keep on playing. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.